Hello and welcome to Business Daily from the BBC. I'm Manuela Saragossa. Coming up, is working from home messing with your head? When your home becomes your workplace, that's, you know, it's, 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 it's full on and it, it's hard to switch off. Mentally, that's really, really draining. And you're just at home trying to do everything. As companies encourage employees to keep working from home, we ask, is it good for us? People have never wanted to when they've adopted flexible working arrangements pre-COVID, never wanted to work 100% from home. The evidence is clear on that. That's coming up here in Business Daily from the BBC. Remember this. The sounds of an office. Some might even say the sounds of another era. You can download it from a website. It's called soundofcolleagues.com. And it's part of a project made by the Swedish sound designers Red Pipe Studios. Tobias Norman is its co-founder. So Sound of Colleagues is actually a website where you can uh, find the sounds from, from your colleagues that you might be missing when you're working from home, which means you can have some uh, clattering from the keyboard, some uh, voices whispering or talking in the phone. <laughs> Uh, the office dog in the background and stuff like that. Then you can create your own um, office environment sound-wise. I think so far we had more than 600,000 people visiting the, the web page from all over the world. And the funniest part is that, that the response is more or less the same all over. People really recognize uh, those sounds and they feel like it feels more comfortable when they're sitting by themselves, uh, working from home, to have a, a bit of, of the office noise in the background. It's that kind of thing that Nyla Salam is missing. She's a young journalist in London, just embarking on her career. Working from home since the lockdown started in March, she says, hasn't been easy. So it's literally like a little desk where you can put like a chair in, but it's really small. But before that, my laptop was on a chest of drawers, which obviously didn't have a space for the chair to go in. So I suffered from really bad back problems from that because I used to sit from the side and then do my work. It wasn't like straight on. My room isn't that big, so I've got my bed and my wardrobe and everything and everything was just is just cramped together. So I just don't have the space. And it's not just her back that suffered. My room has turned into my workstation, a gym, a cafe, you know, where I sleep. I'm just thinking it's all just, it's all, it was all dwelling on me, it was getting to me. So um, there was a period of time where I just felt quite anxious and I was angry. It was quite hard, I'm not going to lie, it was very hard for me. Even though I was on social media a lot, I was becoming very antisocial. Because everything was going on in my head, I didn't really want to speak to anyone. But some days I'd get up and I'd just be so demotivated and I'd be like, what, what, like, why am I here? Like, what am I doing? You know, I'm not even in the office or I'm not going out of the house. I'm just, again, it's the same routine. I wake up, work, eat, go back to sleep. And then it's every day, it's the same routine. So I'm thinking, I don't even want to be here. I don't like this. Nyla would quite like to get back into the office. But even as countries around the world lift their lockdowns, many employers plan to make working from home a permanent thing or at least give employees the choice. Among them, Twitter, Facebook, Google. Also, the French automaker PSA. It's said non-production staff will work remotely from now on. And there are plenty of smaller companies more than happy to scrap their offices altogether, saving money in the process. But what are the mental health and well-being implications for employees? Dr Sophia Bayoric is a research fellow at the Institute for Employment Studies here in the UK. She's been researching that very question. I think it's very dependent on your situation. When workers were compelled to work from home as a result of COVID, people were having to adjust to a variety of unfamiliar communication problems, balancing parenting, homeschooling, elder care. Along with that, people might have been feeling greater isolation and anxiety about feeling that they needed to remain productive. COVID has also added this fear of job security, the looming recession, anxieties about catching COVID itself and everything connected with that. Working from home at this point 
could actually be very difficult because of the related anxieties around it. For some, working from home could be brilliant. It could be the flexibility, autonomy that it provides. But for others, there is evidence that it could lead to poor emotional well-being at this time. But also, I imagine if you are have already been working from home regularly before the pandemic, then you clearly have the structures in place to make it work. And a lot of the, the anxiety must surround the fact that not everyone has the infrastructure and the, the structures in place to work effectively from home. There's a structure and related to that, having all the IT and the technology and the communication channels that you have. But there's also a thing about the routine. There's been a lot of um, discussion about work-life balance especially the younger people who might not have their own house, who might be having to live in a student flat or having a house share, they might not even have a spare room in which they could work. And so they might be working as well as sleeping in their bedroom. So they don't have that feeling of dissociating work time and home time. And so they're not being able to escape work. That can have an impact for people's work-life balance, their stress and their mental health as well. And you can imagine those who um, parents during the pandemic who had to homeschool. So having children whilst trying to work is also a very difficult circumstance to be in. Personally, I'm a, a carer. So I have a mother with early onset Alzheimer's. And so I've had to adjust my working from home pattern. I've had to take on additional caring needs and work that around my working day. I've got no qualms about doing that, but it does mean that sometimes you feel like you're wearing multiple hats, but sometimes neither of them with a plum. So you do sometimes feel guilty that you're not doing one job as well as you could. Are there any situations you can give an example of where you've had to make a choice? Either it's you concentrate on your work or you concentrate on your mother and something has had to give. Yeah, it's it's, it's a stupid thing. It's just um, sometimes when I've been on a Zoom phone call and mum comes in and she might have forgotten the way to the toilet in the house and so you just have to say, excuse me, I just need to deal with my mum for 10 minutes. You know, I can still hear you in the background because, you know, you can just turn up the volume so you can hear what's going on in the call. You just can't be physically present, your face on the video. It is things like that. There are ways of working about it, but you do sometimes feel like, oh, I should have been giving my mum that attention and work was grabbing it at the same time. There are so many companies now that are saying, you know, we're going to make working from home a permanent feature. We're going to give people the choice of whether they want to come in or not. And it, clearly there's been a working from home revolution. It's been shown to work. People are productive when they are at home. They can be productive. But what advice would you have for the many companies who've been saying they're going to make this a permanent thing from here, here on? I would say check with your employees to say whether that is a sensible way forward. Some people might need to work from home part-time, some people might need to work from home full-time, but what's important is to understand your employees' needs, to continue having these conversations with employees about what is going to be best for them, what will help them the most when it comes to thinking about returning to the office or long-term working from home in the future. Don't just assume that employees are going to be all in for it, basically. Exactly. I, I don't think that assumption can be made. For many people, working from home just might not be a viable option. They might not have the space. They might not have the living conditions to do so. They might not want to. Some people like structure of an office. And I think something that has been seen quite a lot during lockdown is this issue of isolation. Some people are feeling really socially isolated. They're not having that office communication, that um, everyday interaction with people that they have really enjoyed in the past. And I think actually working from home could have negative business impacts. I think sometimes when you're having those instant conversations or those water cooler moments that people call them, that, that often sparks a lot of creativity, a lot of productivity. It can be an opportunity or a time when people start having ideas about project work or how to innovate. And I think if those conversations are reduced or disabled because of working from home, you know, it could be really dangerous for a lot of creativity and impact. And this issue of social isolation, I think, is something that's really important that organisations need to be aware of. Dr. Sophia Bayorek, 
So those are the concerns. But surely technology, the boom in video conferencing services, can more than make up for those missed chats over the water cooler. Over to Carrie Cooper. He's Professor of Organisational Psychology and Health at Manchester Business School in the UK. The thing that people, I think, find difficult is the lack of social contact. That's the biggie. They generate ideas and they like being with people. They meet their social needs. That's what human beings do. You know, we've had the technology for a long time and in many professions you could have worked 100% from home. But it's the social needs that people get from going into a workplace. We know that you bounce off ideas. You're much more creative when you're working with other people. I don't think you can do it adequately on Zoom or any of the other social platforms. But why is that? Because, I mean, Zoom, you can socialise on Zoom. There have been Zoom cocktail parties during lockdowns. What is it about face-to-face contact that seems to spark ideas in a way that doesn't happen when you meet with people digitally? What it is, it's what we call the nonverbal forms of behaviour. You don't get the full nonverbal forms of communication, i.e., eye contact, facial expression, body posture. You don't get that. You pick up these nonverbal cues all the time, the body language that people have, how they sit, how they respond to what you say. And all of those nonverbals are really important in developing new ideas, new products, new services from a work point of view. And after you've had a formal meeting where you're kind of idea creating, You then leave and go have a cup of coffee. And it's over those situations that lots of things come out where somebody says, well, I didn't say that during the meeting, but you know what I thought about when you said that? And that's how it happens when you're face to face and it doesn't happen as well on Zoom or any of the other uh, social platforms. Does that mean that people are wrong to expect working from home to become the norm? We have learned to work from home. We know the technology basically works, but people still have their social needs to be met. So my prediction will be in the future that people will work substantially from home, but go into a central office environment from time to time to have meetings, to meet your social needs, and all of that. So your home environment will be your primary workplace, but you won't be exclusively there. People have never wanted to when they've adopted flexible working arrangements pre-COVID, never wanted to work 100% from home. The evidence is clear on that. They want to have a central office environment to go to, and you need that for sparking ideas, team building, and to meet your social needs. So short term will be people will go to the central office environment to commune again, to team build again, to get ideas about how they're going to work. However, as time goes by, then people will gravitate back to the home environment. The evidence is if people want to work flexibly and they're allowed to and there are no real constraints to it, they are much more job satisfied. They really are. They say things like where I work from, when I work and everything else is is up to me. I'm in control. I have control and autonomy at work. Stress at work is the leading cause of sickness absence. Take a country like the UK, 57% of all long-term sickness absence is due to stress, depression, and anxiety. One of the biggest causes of stress at work is people feeling they don't have any control or, or autonomy over their job. Give them flexible working. Trust them and value them and say, Listen, this is what you have to achieve. Where you achieve it, when you achieve it, how you achieve it, from what facility you achieve it from is your business. We'll help you and support you. Just go ahead and do it. So it's about giving people control. That is good for people's mental health. Absolutely. And the evidence is clear. There are thousands of study on job control. The more you have control over your job, the more productive you are, The more job satisfied you are, the less sickness absence you have, particularly stress-related sickness absence. And that is the future. And we just learned from that that we can actually do this. We can work much more flexibly. But there are still a proportion of people who find that difficult. Professor Carrie Cooper. So a happy medium and one where employees and not bosses retain some control. 
all of which might explain how Caroline Joynson has arranged her working life. She runs her own PR company in the UK and for many years she worked from home. Eventually, though, she opted for a co-working space. During lockdown, she had to give that up and work from home again, but she headed straight back to her co-working space as soon as the lockdown was lifted. She told me why. I mean, I think the thing is when you work from home and you have family around and you just basically permanently feel guilty, you feel guilty for not being with the family and the kids, but you're working. Or if you're not working, you feel guilty because you're not working and you're with the family and the kids. So you're really torn most of the time. Mentally, that's really, really draining. And you're just at home trying to do everything. The boundaries are gone, basically. The boundary between home life and work life. Yeah, I think that's the thing. There were really hard times where I just thought, this is impossible, you know, and not having that option to go off to the co-working space and have that quiet time and that headspace. It took me right back to when I kind of was first trying to run the business from home and, and all the reasons why I then decided to go into a co-working space. So it was like going back in time, but being trapped in that situation. So yeah, it was really stressful. You know, five days at home on your own is a lot of time in your own company. And that was another reason why co-working worked for me, because no one's really meant to be on their own five days a week, full-time hours. When you hear companies, and we've had a few companies on our programme here on Business Daily, say, we're going to give up the office completely, there's no point anymore, we're just getting everyone to work from home. What do you think? I wonder whether there's some sort of middle ground. And I think both are needed. I don't think it can be one or the other. And I think now it's proved with lockdown that people can work from home. You know, people that were told it's never an option for you to work from home and almost like bosses didn't trust them. Well, they've had to trust them now. But I think for mental health reasons and for building a a successful team, having some time together in a workplace environment is essential. Caroline joins in there, making the case for a working life set at least partly in the office. She brings us to the end of this edition of Business Daily. Today's producer was Edwin Lane. And do get in touch. Is it too soon to talk about the end of the office? Do you miss it? The Twitter handles are at Manuela BBC or at BBC Business. I'll leave you with a little office nostalgia. 